Yeah, we're talking to Isaac Starobin today. He owns Dirty Dog Barbecue in Prague. and uh, But he's from New York, from Yonkers in New York. And his original plan was to become a, a lawyer. He went into political science, studied in New Orleans, but w- that dropped out, uh, liked, uh, well, stopped because he, he preferred to work in, in, in restaurants and he liked the at- atmosphere. So he told me, yeah, a little bit about how he became a chef. He worked in Michelin Star's restaurant in, in New York. Um, very tough school, by judging by what he said about it. And uh, yeah, and how he ended up here in Prague by a random coincidence. Came here for a holiday and has been here now for 12, 13 years. And uh, and his business journey is here, which haven't all been successful, but uh, he's one of those guys that just doesn't give up and that doesn't stop at anything. As he says himself, he's got a chip on his shoulder that, that he needs to somehow either get rid of or satisfy. And uh, yeah, it was a good talk. Uh, he has opinions. And uh, yeah, he's not afraid of voicing them. Mm, and uh, yeah, we went kind of all over the place. We talked about political correctness and how it is to get people today and what's the biggest challenge in the restaurant business, how COVID has changed it and all that stuff. So interesting talk. I really like talking to Isaac and I actually forgot at the end of the episode to tell him to share <coughs> where to follow him, but you can find his place, Dirty Dog Barbecue, on both Instagram and Facebook. And of course, you can go and try it out and they're at a place called Manifesto Market in Prague. Uh, great place and uh, yeah, good food, great guy. It was fun. Um, sponsors, that's Alfred Jobs, Alfred.cz, where you find your dream job. <coughs> if you have a shitty job, then you can always change, and nobody knows that you're looking because Alfred is anonymous. So, yeah, you can set up like a job board so that you get sent to you the relevant jobs that, that you're looking for, and you can apply with one click. Available in English, Czech, and Slovak, and Russian, and jobs all over the Czech Republic and Slovakia. Uh, cool stuff. And then the old bar, um, Prague's one of Prague's most uh, popular restaurants um, sells oatmeal and uh, skir, Icelandic recipe, organic, made specifically for the old bar. You can get those two base layers with uh, different toppings, amazing stuff. Everything is in-house, made by hand, with passion, and there is love in every fucking bowl that they put on the table. You gotta try it out, guys. And... Uh, Available also for delivery on Vault and Bolt, for those of you who don't want to leave the house. And uh, yeah, check them out. They're also on social media, the old bar Prague. That's it, guys. Enjoy. So, hi, Isaac Starobin. How are you? Oh, I'm great. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. I was just telling you before we started now that you have such a great podcast voice that I'll, I'll come <laughs> have you on here on every show as an actor pretending to be someone else. <laughs> I'll pretend to be Jeff Cohen next time. I'll yeah, say some bad stuff yeah, about his place. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can talk shit about another restaurant. <laughs> He's a friend of mine. I'm kidding. I'm yeah. Jeff Cohen, by the way, guys, was on my, on, on my episode, um, I don't know, five, six episodes ago. Uh, Becoming Bad Jeff, I think it was called. Check that out. He owns a, a cool restaurant in Prague. Um, Isaac... Starobin. Where is the Starobin name from? That's actually the name of the village in Belarus where we apparently come from generations and generations ago. Uh-huh. But we've been in uh we've been in the US for five or six generations now. So there's not much connection to to, to the so to the country. You don't speak country. Russian. Not a word. You're not a friend of Lukashenko. <laughs> I always had a dream that I could like move to Belarus, date his daughter, become his son-in-law, and become like I don't know, like junior dictator of a country or something <laughs> like that. I don't know. Yeah. He's got some really cool friends. I saw saw a video of him with uh, Steven Seagal. Really? Yeah, and they were <laughs> it was so fucked up. They went out guys, check this out on YouTube. Steven Seagal and and Luka, Alexander Lukashenko. They they went out to a field and pulled out uh, carrots from the ground and ate them <laughs> like surrounded by gen- it's it's just so weird it stuff, you know. That's awesome. Yeah. Um Isaac, you're here because we met, uh, I don't know, maybe five years ago or something. I sat next to you on uh, with another previous guest of my podcast, Craig, the American Barber in Prague. Yep. And I remember you you sat in the chair next to me. Uh, they were not doing your hair. They were doing your beard, I think. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And, uh, and I remember, uh, this guy can really, really fucking talk. <laughs> 
And then I real and you were telling telling us about what you you had a, at that time you had a food truck. Yeah, yeah. So, what is that about? What what was that about? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, yeah, well, that was a. Uh, it had to be a little more than five years ago at this point. Uh, probably about five years ago. Yeah. Yeah. We had a food truck, uh, and we we traveled around the country to food festivals, uh, concerts, expositions, you name it. Basically, any, any place where there were a lot of people and somebody could give us electricity, we yeah. would drive our truck out there and cook whatever American food we felt like that day. It yeah. was uh, Those were interesting times, you know, for, for, uh, for someone who grew up or for someone who came up in the New York City restaurant industry. Uh, working the grill in a truck was not exactly how I saw my life no. turning out, but it was fun. It was a great, it was a great, great couple of years. Yeah, and then that then turned into Dirty Dog. Yeah, then we, uh, yeah, then we, 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 we built from there. Um, basically, by taking the truck around, we were able to build up a, a clientele of catering clients, which was nice. So we would uh, cook for weddings, company parties, birthday parties, things like that. Um, from there, we built up a bit of a name, and we started uh, at Manifesto Market. In Florence mm-hmm. in 2018. Mm-hmm. Manifesto is like a food court, a outdoor food court in a way, or like a yeah, yeah, like a what is this called? Is uh, I guess an outdoor food court would be the would be the best way to put it. Uh, yeah. You know, a food market. That's that's what they're calling them these days. The for your American listeners, Chelsea Market in Manhattan. Yeah, is yeah, yeah, yeah right. exactly. I've been there. That's yeah. that's a very similar concept actually. Yeah, or Box Park in the UK, something like that. Yeah, and uh, and that, and and so the, you you kind of went from the food truck into having what is it called dirty dog barbecue yeah yeah then we we rebranded just a little bit you know we had been doing sort of broader a broader version of american food that included some barbecue but really just whatever american food i felt like doing on a given mm, day mm. and then we sort of narrowed it down to really do the barbecue concept that i had been wanting to do for a long time right mm-hmm. so we're talking different types of meat that you cook in the smoker for 8 12 16 24 hours well, that's a brisket and ribs and brisket ribs pulled pork uh, you, i mean anything really the, the the key for something the key for a meat to be barbecue is that it has to be a really shitty piece of meat. It has to be meat that's uh, you know from a muscle that's used really often. Uh-huh. Uh, so you're not going to do it. You're not going to barbecue any uh, filet mignon, any, t- any beef tenderloin. That's not good for barbecue. Something a muscle that gets a lot of use has a lot of collagen, a lot of connective tissue. Uh, a muscle that takes a lot of work to really bring out the flavor. Uh-huh. So these are the these are the really flavorful muscles, but you can't just you can't just whack it on a grill and then eat it like you could do with a with a with a steak or something like that. So you take you take kind of those nasty cuts of meat that I love; those are my favorites, and you just you 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 pour smoke and heat into it for uh-huh. as long as it takes to break down the collagen, break down the connective tissue, and release the the flavors that are built up in there. So that so so these are actually the cuts that maybe nobody else would want. That would have been true like twenty or thirty years ago, yeah. right? So like twenty or thirty years ago, and even and long long before that, yeah, you had cuts like brisket, short ribs, you had fish like. Uh, fucking monkfish, uh-huh. long before that lobster, all these things that are now being sold for 40, 50 bucks a plate in New York. These used to be the shitty pieces of, of meat and shitty fish that the butcher or the fishmonger took home for his family because nobody wanted to buy them. Uh-huh. Now, of course, people are finally realizing how beautiful they are. Yeah, yeah. And, you know. Well, that's interesting. I didn't know that. And, and so now you have, uh, th- like this manifesto, this, uh, these are ba- basically 40 feet con- containers converted into restaurants, right? Yeah, exactly right. Uh, they... Well, they give us a container yeah. that has electricity and water coming into it. And, that's and then you it. do the rest of the fit out. Yeah, then we do the rest of the fit out. Uh, thank God. I, you, you don't want somebody else building your kitchen for you. Um, mm-hmm. But yes, yeah, so you got uh, down at Florence, the original manifesto, you've got about 17 containers with food, another three or four with, with beverages. Mm-hmm. And at the new manifesto in Anyo, where, we're also, where we also have a stand, uh, I think about, this, about 20 containers with food. Mm-hmm. So, so you're in both. You're in both. both yeah, we're in both. We're in ah, both. Okay. We started in Florence. Then when they opened Anyo, we opened up there too. Uh-huh. And no more food trucks. No, no more food trucks. No, no more. No more driving around the country. Uh, that must be m- must be a, a like very different concept though to run something in a food market than to be driving around. I mean, just the access to stuff and you access know. to the basic things like water yeah, and yeah, electricity. Yeah. yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And it's but it's it's this is kind of back to what I was trained for, right? I was trained in restaurants. I wasn't trained in trucks yeah. and and, yeah. and and tents yeah. so this is kind of back to back to basics for me and it's it's much nicer much much nicer so you said that the, so the family left belarus five six generations ago and to went to new york right yeah that's, we don't, where, we, that's where you were born yeah yeah i was born in new york um my family my parents come from brooklyn and philadelphia respectively uh before that a few more generations in new york city and philadelphia uh-huh. 
my father's mother was born in what was then Palestine, was now Israel. Um, uh, but outside of outside of her, outside of my father's mother, everyone else has been in the U.S. for generations upon generations. No. We're talking, you know, great great grandparents might have come from Poland or Lithuania or something like that. Uh-huh. And you you um, you lived in a town called Yonkers. I've always been very curious about this. You know, it's a name that I, you know, you see often. And it's in the state of New York, right? Yeah, it's uh, the first city north of New York City. And what what kind of city is this? What's the <laughs> well? Yonkers is cool because it's a uh, Yonkers is where you move when you've done well enough living in New York City to be able to move to the suburbs, but not well enough to move to the really nice suburbs. Uh huh. So, and that's changing a bit now. Um, it, it is getting nicer and nicer. But when my parents first moved there, it was because they were able to buy a really really big house for the same price as a really really tiny house in one of the nicer suburbs. Mm-hmm. And it was it was kind of a shithole back then. Um, but we had a wonderful childhood, you know. Our little neighborhood of Yonkers was safe and clean and beautiful. Yonkers is, I don't think there's anybody named Smith or Jones who lives in Yonkers. Uh-huh. It's its overwhelmingly, uh, you know, the children of Irish, Italian, and Puerto Rican immigrants. Uh-huh. So it's very, very cool. And then the occasional Jewish. Yeah, there was a, there was a small little Jewish community. We, uh, it was us and, I don't know, probably... 200, 300 other families. There were, there were, there, there was a sizable minority of Jews in, uh-huh. in, in Yonkers. Very, very few w- waspy white people. Uh huh. And and how? But what do people do there? I mean, is is it just a suburb, or is it? Is, does it have? I mean, I don't know, like tree locking, or you know, is there some? some <laughs> is there something in Yonkers? You know, is there something made in Yonkers? Or? Um, it's a good question. Uh, it used to be a, it used to be pretty industrial. There's not uh-huh. much of that anymore uh, anywhere in New York. Um. I don't. I don't have any data to back this up, but I believe that m- most of the white collar people com- in Yonkers commute to the city. They commute to Manhattan to work, and it's a. So in that sense, it's a bedroom community, but there's a, it's a big enough city, right? We're talking. I, I have absolutely no idea how big it is. I have no. I have no fucking idea how many people <laughs> live there. I want to say a quarter million people. Yeah. I could. I could be off by. Yeah, yeah. I could be off by whatever. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but it is big enough that it has its own economy, right? Yeah. yeah. The, 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 People who live there also work. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's not just a suburb that people come and sleep in. And, and right, no, it's not morning. just a bedroom community. Yeah. It's, a, it's 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 a pretty big it's a pretty big city. It's a, yeah. I think the fourth biggest city in New York State, something like that. It's kind of a turn off though for me because I had high hopes for the name Yonkers. It's such a cool name somehow, you know. <laughs> it's Dutch. Yeah, <laughs> you know the, the, those uh-huh. crazy Dutchmen with their with their funny sounding words. I have oh, no idea what it means though. That makes sense though when you yeah. say it. Yeah, I, ne- I never gave I never thought about that. Um, so you're Jewish, and. Obviously, your whole family, I mean, but not like religious Jew. You're secular, right? Yeah, no, we're as secular as can be. My grandparents were Orthodox, uh, which scared the shit out of my parents, so they they want nothing to do with that anymore. Uh-huh. Uh, we grew up going to synagogue every week more because uh, that's what Jews and Yonkers do to meet the other Jews and Yonkers. Uh-huh. Um, and so, it became, you know, that's where most of our friends growing up, where we knew them from. So that's like a co- more of a community exactly. thing than a than a religious thing. Exactly right. Exactly mm-hmm. right. So. Uh, um, yeah, you, we're, you eat everything. Then I mean, you don't. You're not uh, kosher. Or, no, or God, no, not at all. I, I, I like to make the joke that between me and Jeff Cohen, we're responsible for like sixty percent of the pork consumption in Vidarati. So, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> so you eat pork? Oh, of course, of course, yeah. of course. And, and your parents do. And well, I mean, that's that's what's interesting. My mom grew up in a house that would never have had pork in it. Mm. Right? There would be no. They, they were very strictly kosher. Mm. After she moved out, when she was around eighteen, she you know went off on her own, stopped with with, with all of that. She still never cooked pork at home when I was growing up. We mm-hmm. go to a restaurant, she would order it, no problem. She loved bacon, she loved, you know, but she would never cook pork at home. And it's it's purely a, a cultural thing. It just felt wrong to her. It felt weird. Mm-hmm. It felt like I don't know. I, I guess maybe like cooking dog or something. Yeah. Not that there's anything inherently wrong yeah. with it. Yeah. It just feels so weird given yeah. the culture you were raised in. Now that my sister and I have moved out, you know, twenty years after that, my mom cooks pork at home all the time. She's gotten yeah. completely over all of this. Yeah. I, I ate dog once. Really? How was it? I, I, it was like beef. It, I, I, if I wouldn't have been told that it was a dog, I wouldn't have known. Nice. I nice. would have thought it was one of those cuts that, <laughs> that needs to be cooked really long. It was a mi- dog miso soup. and uh, Where was that? In North Korea, actually. Excellent. And uh, it, 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 wasn't, it wasn't bad at all. I mean, I, I, I was... But it felt wrong. Sure, exactly, right? I, I, it and, just and, feels wrong. Yeah, and, and I remember I was like, hmm, I like this, but I'm not supposed to like it, you know? <laughs> I wouldn't cook it at home. Right, of course not. Of course not. <laughs> um, but uh, and how 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 were you? Were you a good kid, troublemaker? I mean, I, you know, I I, I could have been worse. I could have been worse. I I wasn't. 
I wasn't a I wasn't a pleasure to raise, but I, I could have been worse. I could have been worse. I don't know. I, I I have always had a lot of trouble with authority. I hate the idea of unquestioned authority. You know, do what I say because I said so. Yeah. Um, and that was always tough for me. So school wasn't easy. Yeah. So you didn't really like school, but you went on to college, right? Yeah, that's uh, that's what was what was expected for somebody who grew up where I grew up in the in you know in the community that I grew up in. That's that's what you do after high school. You go to uh-huh. college. Um, so I you know I was lucky enough to go to schools that prepared me very well for college, and I was unlucky enough to be the kind of person who is just not suited for that environment at all. And in what way? You just didn't you weren't interested? Or no, I, mean, I can't I can't I can't I can't focus on something if I don't see some sort of concrete potential outcome from it. Yeah, like, I, I I I'm horrible at seeing the big picture. I'm horrible at seeing the long term. I see, I, I, I'm tunnel visioned, I see what's right in front of me, and I'm horrifically, horrifically attracted to short-term gains yeah. at like, you know, I'm just the kind of person who, who instant gratification is what I'm looking yeah, for. Yeah, head on just a little bit more. Yeah, especially at that age, instant gratification was all yeah. I cared about. If yeah. there was something that's going to make me happy and excited right now, I'm going to do it. I'm, gonna, I'm looking for the shiny objects, right? Yeah, yeah. I was 17 years old living in New Orleans, you know, it was a, for a guy like me, that was a... Were you, were you in school there? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. How, how come? Uh, how come New Orleans? I mean, like, you had family there? Or no, 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 no. Hard to say. You know, where, where I'm from, everyone goes away for college, right? Uh-huh. You, you, you choose the college you want to go to based on the college you want to go to, not based on where it is, or based on where it is in the sense that it's far away from where you come from. Um, so that's campus life, and, and yeah, exactly, and the whole that's thing. exactly, exactly right. That's campus life, and it was a ton of fun. I had a great time. I had mm. just a just a wonderful time down there. But I, you know, I made a lot of stupid decisions, and there were so many things that were more attractive to me than going to class mm. and focusing. What were you on studying? Me. What was it? That you I was studying mean? political science. Uh-huh. <laughs> I, I, I wanted to be okay. a lawyer. What do you want me to tell you? Yeah. <laughs> um, but it, it, everything was more attractive to me than going to class, right? Yeah. So I, I, I ended up working in a. Uh, kind of a shitty bar and grill, uh-huh. just slinging burgers and sandwiches and pizza, just to, to make a little more cash so I could drink more, yeah, <laughs> put more stuff more, up yeah, my nose back yeah, then. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I loved it. I really enjoyed it. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, and some of the guys who I was working for had actually been legit chefs back in the day, and they were getting older, and they didn't want to work in such a high pressure environment anymore. So they were managing the kitchen in this shitty bar and grill. Mm. <coughs> uh and that really, that was just so much more attractive to me than studying, which mm. is a shame, you know, I, but. Yeah, but it's also, I, I can see it because if you, I, I, it kind of makes me think back because I did the same when I went to, went to university, I always had these jobs and you got the money right away, you, yeah. were, you were in something, there was some action and then school was, yeah, there's a fucking exam in the spring <laughs> yeah, and, exactly. you know, and you're in somewhere in October and you, you know, you're not thinking about spring, you're exactly. thinking about next weekend, you exactly. know. Exactly. So I, 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 yeah, I think I can see where that comes from because you know you you get some rewards right away and you see some of the results and, and stuff like that. Right. It's so all about the instant gratification, exactly. So you dropped out. Uh, yeah, I, I dropped out. Um, yeah, uh, and I moved back to New York and I went to culinary school because I was I, I was like, all right, I'm clearly never going to go back to college. Mm. In this world, you have to have a college degree or you have to have a skill. You got to be able to do something. I was terrified of being one of those guys who had neither. That's a that's a scary place to be, right? So I was like, all right, I'm never gonna get this college degree, but I love I, I love working in restaurants. I love to cook. Mm. Let's go to culinary school. Let's make it. You know, let's let's do this for real instead of just you know having my little shitty bar and grill experience. Let's do this for real. So I moved back to New York, uh, moved to Queens, Astoria, great little neighborhood in Queens. Went to culinary school, finished that. Uh, did very well there. That was something that I, uh, you know, that hit home. Somehow. That hit home real uh-huh. well. You know, that was because you see the results. You know, you see no. the results. It's not a. There, there's nothing vague or ambiguous about why you're doing what you're doing today. Mm-hmm. You're going to see the results on the plate in 20. And minutes. is it, in culinary school? How is that? Is it is it a lot of theory or is it just practice? Uh, it's about half and half. It's about uh-huh. half and half. There's a lot of theory, which is why you know a lot of young guys ask me if they should go to culinary school if, or if they should just go to work. I say 90% of the stuff you need to know in order to be a, a successful chef, you're going to learn on the job, not in school. Mm. But if you don't go to school, you're never going to have that theoretical background, which mm-hmm. I don't know how important it is for your career. I'm glad I have it, right? I'm and glad what, I How has that helped you? I mean, what, what is it, what, what part of that 10%, you know, like that? Well, it didn't help me at all as a cook, right? Mm-hmm. It, was, it, was, it was completely useless information as a cook. Now, that, now as a chef, um, you know, building recipes, understanding the food science, mm. understanding how 
various, you know, basic recipes have developed over time from Escoffier back in the 1800s to us now. That's very helpful. Mm-hmm. That's really, really helpful. Mm-hmm. Um, being able to, you know, put a kitchen together, build a menu, build a team. That in in those in that the more, more kind of the business and and development exactly, part of exactly the, the high level chef skills. Yeah, uh, yeah, I've definitely benefited from understanding the theory and the science mm. as a, as a line cook day to day. No, well, it's, you know, ninety percent of what you need to know for that you learn in the kitchen while you're working. Mm-hmm. There's someone screaming at you. <laughs> I mean, yes, yes, absolutely. And you, and you, you, you. Uh, but what did your parents say about this? Were they uh, because I, I, don't, I didn't ask you what did they do? And did they want you to be a lawyer? Or well, my, uh, all right, my parents are great. My parents are fantastic. They, um, they somehow managed to find this beautiful balance between being completely accepting and also encouraging success. Mm-hmm. Right? They would never say. Oh, you, you, Isaac, you're a young Jewish kid. You must be a lawyer or a doctor. Like, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. like the, the, the... The stereotype. Exactly, exactly. They say, you want to be a lawyer? All right, fucking work hard in school, become a lawyer. When, when that didn't work out, and, you know, I, I, there were some... They, they were the most supportive people in the world. They said, all right, start over. Figure it out. Let's, you know, let's, let's, let's figure this out together. Mm-hmm. So, they're, they're, so they're, there was no drama in the family when... Isaac came home from New Orleans, New Orleans to start cooling. No, school. no, 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 no. I mean, there there was drama in the sense that uh, <laughs> it was what were they going to tell their friends at the synagogue? You know, yeah, no, yeah, no, it's not like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, they were they were incredibly supportive. They, would, my parents, want their kids to be happy, healthy, mm. well adjusted, mm. and give them grandkids. Mm. That's what they want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and um, and then you you go into after after you finished cooling school, you went into uh, you were working in a Michelin place in in New York, right? Yeah, when you well, finish, that, that's part of the studies, or yeah. And, well, when you finish culinary school, you got to do an apprenticeship. We call it an externship. I, I don't know why we call it an externship instead of an internship. It's that that word is only ever used in restaurants. I don't yeah. know why. So my goal was to find. Yeah, you do your externship for free, right? You're not getting paid during that time. My goal was to find the best restaurant that could possibly have me, right? Because if, if you're offering free work, you're like you're, you're able to get into a much higher class of place than you will. You know, consider you have basically zero experience. My my grill cook experience didn't count for shit. Mm. Um, so what I did was I, I I went around to like all the all the best restaurants in what's called the Zagat Guidebook, mm. the the restaurant guide. Yeah, book yeah, I've seen know? that book. Yeah, yeah. So I went around to all the best restaurants and I left my my CV, my resume at the at the front desk, and then I went home and I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna start getting phone calls now and nothing, you know, <laughs> fucking crickets, absolutely nothing. <laughs> so like, all right, we need a better we need a better strategy here. So instead of going to the front desks, to the, you know, the reservation, the hostess desk at these restaurants, I went around to the back. I looked for the cooks on their cigarette break. I would go between like 3 o'clock and 5 o'clock in the afternoon when there's not much happening. Everyone's doing prep. They're going outside for their smoke break. I would wait for them to come outside for their smoke break, give them my, my, my resume, introduce myself, say, guys, look, I want to peel your mushrooms for you. I want to, I want to clean your onions for you. Who do I talk to? Mm-hmm. Some of them were like, oh, who cares? Another fucking kid looking for an externship. These, you know, but some of them took me inside, introduced me to the chef, and that's how I ended up getting into Craft Restaurant. Uh-huh. Uh, that's by, in Manhattan. That's or? in Manhattan, yeah, Midtown Manhattan, owned by Tom Caliccio, the former host of Top Chef, which was the original like Master Chef and all uh-huh. that. And that was man, that was a uh, <laughs> that was it was rated the number five restaurant in New York by New York Magazine, and it was an unbelievable place. It was an, a monster in every sense of the word. It was packed every single day you couldn't leave there without spending three hundred dollars a person uh-huh. and this is we're talking almost 20 years ago now now 15 years ago and the kitchen was i mean i've never seen equipment that beautiful that perfectly maintained all the stainless steel surfaces were like mirrors because they were cleaned so many times a day we all had to change our chef's coats and our aprons three times a day wow. we we're only open for dinner three times a day had to change everything once before service started and once in the middle of service. Obviously, once when you get there. And it, it, was, it was like the greatest and the worst experience of my life. Yeah. So glad I did it. But I still, I still like wake up in a cold sweat sometimes with, with remembering. Because it, it, is it like this that like, you know, I heard stories about some of the chefs from Iceland. Because in Iceland, they, they started sending chefs to, to London and, sure. and places like, and they came back. Yeah, yeah, he broke under the pressure. He gave up yep. and, you know, like screaming, shouting. Really like a uh, tough love. Is yeah. it like that? Uh, it depends where you go. It depends where you go. Uh, the higher level of the restaurant, yeah. Uh-huh. And there are exceptions, of course. There are exceptions. There were like two or three restaurants. Chanterelle was one of them. Chanterelle, that's, uh, I can't remember where. It was in Manhattan. Mm. And I had some friends who worked there. And when we would go out for drinks after work, I would tell them about my day. And they would tell them about theirs. And I'm like, yeah. how can a restaurant work 
in such a calm, res- mutually respectful environment. I'm yeah. like, what the fuck is that? Yeah. But that's how it was at Chantrell for whatever reason. But it really, above a certain level, yeah, it's a very, very chaotic, stressful environment. But is it is is it needed? Uh, uh, do you know, like, uh, I mean, obviously we've seen, you know, Gordon Ramsay screaming in the kitchen. Yeah. Uh, that's TV. I that's mean, TV, that, that, yeah. that's, that's That's entertainment, or... Um, <laughs> entertainment of seeing some <laughs> young people broken right. down by, by a chef. <laughs> um, but you want another beer? You're good. Uh, if I open this, is it going to mess up with the levels? No, 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 no. It's fine. Um, yeah, but um, what I was saying. Yeah. So, I- is it a show? Or like, do you know what I mean? Like all this screaming exactly or shouting in the kitchen I in know a exactly restaurant what you like mean. this. Uh, here's here's the thing. It depends on the. It depends on the level of the restaurant. It depends on the customers. It depends on the expectations. I'm sure that it is possible to run a kitchen in a quiet, calm, mutually respectful environment. That would be like a vegan restaurant. <laughs> well, you know, I, I don't yell at my kitchens anymore because we're not at that level, you know. But at a certain level, at the New York City level, where the competition is ridiculous, every single dish must go out perfect, perfectly. There's zero margin for error there. Zero margin for error. Um, and a, a professional kitchen is one of those few places in the world where you're working in real time, if that makes sense. Mm. You're not doing something today that someone's going to see three weeks from now. Mm-hmm. The thing that you're doing right now is going to be consumed and judged in 30 seconds. By someone who paid $300. Exactly right. Mm. Exactly right. So the expectations are huge. The margin for ever, error is zero. You never know which one of these people is going to be you know, Ruth Reichel from the New York Times, one of the, a, a critic who can sink your restaurant overnight. This is the old days when restaurant critics worked really hard to maintain anonymity. It's not like today where they say, hi, I'm a critic, yeah, give yeah, me free stuff, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> that, that, we call them influencers now. <laughs> oh, God, I'm allergic to that word. <laughs> but 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 how, so so like, I don't know, like you remember any any specific event or moment where, you know, like you got in the in the corner you know somehow that uh, sure 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 oh my god yeah i mean so after like after six months of uh, uh, as an apprentice at craft that was really just peeling uh, cleaning mushrooms doing really the bitch work and mm-hmm. then i would stay for a few hours later and hang out on the line where the cooks would show me what they were doing let me taste stuff uh, that was just to learn mm-hmm. learn learn learning everything i could that was the name of the game back then. how did you make a living because this is free and you spent a lot of hours well i, I mean i was in school at the time right so that was uh, that was part of school right yeah was, i know I, I but was, i mean like you, I, you I, lived I, with I, your par- no no you no, no, no I, I, I lived in queens at that point um but i i mean i had savings my parents were helping okay. me out a bit i was yeah. i was 19 years old at the time because this doesn't sound like something you can just do like you know if you if you need to work six months in this ex- What's you called it? Uh, externship, externship, yeah. externship. Then uh, you know, like, and and then you 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 do your work, and then you do some extra hours just to learn. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I was lucky. I was lucky enough that I was mm-hmm. young. There were some people in my in my school who were older. It was their second career. You know, it was a career change, and they didn't have that luxury, right? So mm-hmm. they would they had to they had to find kind of a shittier place that would be like, oh yeah, we're thrilled to have your help for two hours a day. We'll write down your hours, you know, for your yeah, externship, yeah. and then they go to work. Yeah. I was lucky enough that I could really focus purely on you know. Mm-hmm. Building my career, building my skill set, it was great. So uh, back to when you got into trouble. Yeah, Somebody so then screamed I, I, after, after my externship was done, they brought me on full time. I was on the salad station, mm. right? This is something that, that you don't have in Prague, the salad station. Mm. All you're doing is salads. No cold appetizers, no desserts. That happens somewhere else, just salads. Um, and one thing you got to do every day is brunoise the bacon for the uh, spinach, bacon, pink peppercorn or some bullshit salad. And so you, you, you take the whole pork belly, Slice it on the on the slicer so that each strip is exactly the same size. Then you put the strips of bake uh, of pork belly into the freezer, pull it out the next morning, and you have to dice each one into brunoise, which means one millimeter cubes. Mm-hmm. And God fucking help you if they're not exactly one millimeter cubes, because that's mm-hmm. when Chef you you, you you feel him, you feel him behind you, right? You feel him behind you, and he. We're talking the the chef de cuisine, the head of the kitchen. Mm-hmm. Under him is you know a senior sous chef, three junior sous chefs lead line cook, and then the rest of the line. So we're, this is like five levels above me at this point, right? And I feel him like fucking on my shoulder. And this is a big guy, Chef Damon Wise, one of the most talented chefs in New York City. Mm. Big, scary motherfucker. And I feel him right on my shoulder. And he like slowly puts his arm over my shoulder, mm. down onto my cutting board, lifts up one cube of bacon, one cube of pork belly, puts it like directly in my eye and goes, throw it out. 
just whispers in my ear like that. He goes, throw it out. I'm like, sorry, chef. And then he fucking yells. He goes, throw it in the fucking garbage. And whacks all this pork belly into the garbage. Makes me do it again. I'm like, I was about to say, like, what, what the fuck was that about? The cook next to me is, oh, boy, he's like, shut up. Shut up and do it Don't again. Shut up and just shut up and do it again, Isaac. Shut up and do it again, right? I didn't sit like that, you know. Was that necessary? Probably not. But it got me in the game, right? It got, it, it got my head in the position where everything must be perfect every single time. Mm. So I don't think he gave a shit that a couple of my cubes of bacon were not exactly right. I think he just wanted to get in my head that this is how we do things here. Yeah, yeah. In this place, these are the expectations. Yeah. It's a mindset or mentality exactly. that it was. But do you, do you think like, because do you think, that, do you think it's still the same? You know, if you would go to this restaurant now, 2021 in 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 Manhattan, they're still like this. Um, I I think they have to be a little more careful with the language these days because there's too much, uh, you know, political correctness. Uh, you know, I don't like to use that word, but yes, exactly, exactly mm. correct. Mm. But I think that the atmosphere is still there, right? I think that the insistence on perfection is still there, mm. and the advantage of being in New York is that. If somebody, I, the amount of people who I watch get fired in the middle of dinner service, it would blow your mind, though. Because if, if this guy can't live up to that level of perfection that you as a chef want him to live up to, there's a hundred other young line cooks banging down the door waiting to get in there. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to do that? Go ahead. Go to some shittier restaurant. Who cares? And what's in it for you? For, for like, th does it then open doors? Absolutely. Like, that you've been there and you survived this? Absolutely. Every single one of my jobs I got because somebody who I worked for called somebody else. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. In New York, it's very rare to hire cooks just from an advertisement on the internet or something. At a, at a certain level, at a higher level, everything comes from within your network. Mm -hmm. And but and but this, when you you need to cut the pork belly into one millimeter cubes, um, did you le learn something a little bit more creative, or I mean, like, or how how is this just the Not life of the? Do the creativity has nothing to do with being a line cook. You you don't want any creativity in your line cooks whatsoever. Uh -huh. What do you want there? You want you want automation. You want robotic. Uh -huh. you, you want somebody who's who's smart enough to know when to pull the bacon off the off the off the off the fire. Uh -huh. But you don't want them deciding when that is. Uh -huh. Right? They, you, you need people who will do who will execute exactly the plays that you call over and over again with perfect consistency. It's it's so many people come to me, they say, Oh, I want to start a restaurant. Oh, I want to go fucking work as a chef because I love to cook. Mm. Oh, you love to cook at home? So fucking cook at home. Stay out of <laughs> if you love to look. I'll tell you a secret, man. I don't love to cook. I don't. Love to, I don't cook at home. No. It's not a hobby for me. I don't give a shit about it, right? I, I. You like the environment. I like the environment. I like to. I like to make good food. I like to 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 see the reaction of people when they eat my food. But I don't. I don't enjoy standing over a stove going, oh, 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 maybe a touch of lemon zest. Like what yeah. the, the, That's not what it's about, <laughs> right? It's it's the difference between somebody who paints portraits in their spare time because they enjoy it. And somebody who paints houses for a living, mm. the, per, the the hobbyist painter is not going to be happy painting painting houses. Mm. And the house painter, mm. I mean, he probably has no idea to be how to, how to paint the oh, portrait. To paint right? the portrait, no, that's true. It's about consistency, speed, mm. cleanliness. But um, so you say, but like, could you could you scream and shout in your kitchen here now? I mean, like, is this? Fuck no. Oh. I mean, look, it's it, it, it's happened. It's mm. happened a couple of times, but. I look back in New York at a, at a place called the Soho House. I was working for a guy named Chef Neil, who was mm. my mentor. Man, he was great. He was he was amazing. B big British guy. Uh, he's got a restaurant in Maryland right now. Amazing guy. He and another guy named Jordan did more for me in my career than any anything else. These guys were my like really took went above and beyond. Took time out of their lives to mentor me and help me, you know, get better at everything. And one day, Chef Neil gave me a promotion. I was going from the the cold station to the grill station. Mm. And he had me train the new kid on the cold station before I moved over, right? So the after, after like a week of training, I teach this kid how to, make, how to make all the salads properly. Easiest thing in the world, right? But a proper salad is made by dressing it properly, right? You take, your, you take all your leaves, you put them in a very dry bowl, you season them with salt and pepper, then you dress the outside of the bowl, right? You take your vinaigrette and apply it to the outside of the bowl. And then you gently toss your leaves, lift them up, put them on the plate. We need a video here. I can see that. You know, <laughs> Isaac is cooking salad. Yeah, but this, on the easy, table. this is easy yeah. shit, right? Just yeah. do, do things right. Just yeah. do things properly. Yeah. It's so easy. Mm. Um, and so after a week of training, just on salads, I'm over on the grill station. I got my guy on the side station next to me. Chef Neil is on the pass, calling the orders, expediting everything. And the kid who I just trained is over on the salad station. And I see that he put up a salad 
where he did that fucking amateur bullshit of putting the leaves in a bowl. And, and then, then like the, squirting the vinaigrette on top yeah. of it. Like I would do. Well, that's what most people do at home, but yeah. that's fine. But yeah. when, when someone's paying us $16 for a salad, do it right. Just do it right, right? Mm. You go to a restaurant because you want stuff to be better than what you get at home. Mm. Not because you just want somebody else to serve it to you. You want it to be better. So he's, he's just doing the exact opposite of what I had showed him. Chef Neil correctly doesn't yell at him. He yells at me. He says, Isaac, what the fuck? I thought you trained this kid. Him, yeah. Exactly. I look over and I'm like, listen, man, come on. You're, you're breaking my heart over here. Do I have to come over there and train you again? Neil looks at me, he goes, Isaac, you're not a cook anymore, you're a chef. Be a chef. And I'm like, oh God, here we go. <laughs> I fucking winged the saute pan across the kitchen and into this guy's head. He ducked, thank God, or I would have got, I don't know, I would go to jail or something. And I just lost my mind on him. Every like bit of frustration that I had built up over the, over the past few weeks of training him just came out in a flood. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, you know, the floor staff is staring at me like I'm an animal. And eventually, I just told him, get the fuck out. I'm going to do your job for you, for you today. And Chef Neil comes over, and he puts an arm around my shoulder. He goes, and now you're a chef. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. And this is, you know, this, is not, this, this is not the ideal way to you know, mentor a young guy, but that's just the way it worked back then. Mm. And it worked. And these were great restaurants, and people had amazing food at all of them. And for, it worked. Mm. I, I did. I, my culinary career is slightly different than yours. I actually went to law school. Nice. And, I gra- and I graduated. Nice. But I, I, I funded my, my way through by working partly in, in restaurants or bars. And, and then there was this, because it's just, <laughs> that was in Iceland. And it was a very different mindset. Because, so I worked in this bar that had a, we had a small menu of five, six items. Like, you know, a la- lamp steak, beef steak, and a pork steak, and deep fried fish. And, uh, and a burger or something. And then, you know, soup and a sauce and, and stuff. And. And the guy tells me, oh, you want to work more hours because we're paid by hours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You can start at 11 in the morning. I'll teach you how to cook. And you can run the restaurant during the day. And then it were open for lunch and dinner. And then it was a bar afterwards. Well, most of people were drinking the whole day also because of the local hop- <laughs> hopos in my, my village and or town. And um, and then, he, yeah, he, he opens the menu, teaches me how to make a base for a, a sauce. And, and then... He says, I need to go to the bathroom. And half an hour later, he's not back. So I went to check on him and he's, he's gone. So I called him on his car phone, you know, which is like this 10 kilo thing that you could Big brick, yeah, right? pull around, you know. <laughs> yeah, I went fishing. You, you just take care of this. And, and I was like, what the fuck? I didn't even know how to boil <laughs> potatoes. So I, so I ended up calling my, my parents, my mom, and, you know, got instructions <laughs> over the phone during the day. And then when it got busy at dinner time, my parents actually came to the restaurant, <laughs> stood outside the, the, the bar table and, and uh, gave me instructions on how to cook. <laughs> that's and that's fantastic. how I became a chef. You know, no one screamed at me, you know, about sure. the customers did, but because I messed it, I, I couldn't make anything ready at the same time. Sure, you know, sure, so sure. I had the fish ready, but not the meat and blah, blah, blah. But it was, that's a great story. That's awesome. Yeah, but it was, it was cool, you know, and I, I yeah, I, I, lo- I actually learned a lot from it. And I, I, like you, I fucking love this environment. Right? Doing dishes, you know, I could just smoke a cigarette, do dishes, listen to music, and talk bullshit. Right, exactly. And exactly. no one, and, and you know, if, if, there, if, if there was a job somewhere that would pay me, it would pay me like $4,000 a month for doing dishes, I would take it in a heartbeat. <laughs> no kidding, man. That would be a great one. I guess a lot of people break from this, you know, like when, when you... And you go into this environment because it's not just the atmosphere, but it's working hours. Yeah, it's, it it becomes a lifestyle. Uh, if you're in it, it's a lifestyle. It has to be a lifestyle. It has to be. You can't be halfway in. Not at that level. You know, and there's that. a lot of drinking, drugs. Oh, I yeah. mean, like that's what you kind of see around. You know, like people oh, yeah. that are in this, and all your friends are in the industry because yeah. you work similar hours. I mean, yeah, absolutely. It's a tribe. And it's a, there's a bit of a correlation causation thing there. I'm not sure if. I'm not sure if the stress of the industry causes, you know, substance abuse problems and antisocial behavior, mm. or if it's that people who are already yeah, uh, struggling yeah, with something yeah, are more yeah, drawn they, to they, this they, industry. Yeah, that yeah. they're they somehow exposed to... Exactly. People are, yeah. Yeah, but exactly. May, and right. Yeah, and uh, that could be. You, you seek this environment for the thrill. Yeah. And it just comes with all the pills. Or, exactly. You know, <laughs> exactly right. Exactly uh, right. I think there's an element of that, definitely. But um, um, how 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 is it then? Like uh, you you get out of that, and then you end up here somehow. You, you and and I think you you came here like twelve years ago, and 
Yeah, I've been here for about 10 or 12 years now. 12 years, closer to 12, yeah. And that was just supposed to be a holiday, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I guess I was burning out a bit. Like, I, I was young enough that I didn't have to worry about that too much. But yeah, the hours are insane. Mm. Um, which I didn't mind back then. I was able to work 60, 70 hours a week and still party. And it, it was great. It was wonderful. Mm. But yeah, I, I, I was, I had traveled a decent amount before then, but I had never really spent a, a long time abroad. Mm. And most people don't, but I knew a few people who, who had, and it, it seemed attractive to me. I said, if I don't do it now, I'll never do it, right? There's always a reason not to, not to go somewhere, not to do something. Mm. So I was like, all right, let's, uh, let's go to Europe for like a year. We'll spend like six months in one place and then just travel around for a while. Mm-hmm. And Prague was the first place I ended up. I don't know why. Uh-huh. And you didn't know anyone here or anything? I, I didn't know. Just... I, I, thought, I thought the city was in Russia or something. I don't know. I don't know, Dick. I don't know what I was getting myself into at all. Uh-huh. Um, but I ended up here somehow. And I, uh, instead of staying for six months and then traveling and going back to New York and focusing on my career, 12 years later, I'm still here. I don't know what happened. And it's so, it's so interesting that almost every expat that you will speak to here has the same. Yeah, I, so I was going to be here for three <laughs> months and I'm here 12 years later, you know? What the, what, what, how did this happen? What, what, it, it, it sucks you in. It does, doesn't it's it? It's like the mafia, you know? It just sucks you in. <laughs> You Once know? you're in, you Once don't get you, out. Yeah, yeah. you, you want to get out, you, they suck you <laughs> in. But, um, well, but, so this is like 2009 or something. Yeah, like that, right? yeah, something like that. What was the first impression of coming here? Man, so the first place I lived was a, a, an apartment in a panelak, an, a, an old, yeah, communist old communist house. prefab building, yeah. In a whole empire full of panelak, <laughs> these disgusting prefabricated gray concrete apartments, apartment buildings, and there's just hundreds of them, as far as the eye can see, out in Stodulki, out in Prague 5. And I'm like, this is the beautiful city of fairy tales I've heard so much about? (laughs) This is the gorgeous, like, old European capital? You must be kidding. So I'm looking around this this wasteland, and I just get on the metro, and I I, I go to the first stop that looks like it's in the center of the city, and that was Anjo. Yeah. And I get out, and what's the first thing I see is this gigantic glassed-in shopping center with McDonald's and KFC in mm-hmm. front. And I'm like, what the fuck? And everybody there is drunk. Exactly. And they're know, just junkies all over the place. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, what the fuck? Did I just come across the ocean for this? Like, you must be crazy. Eventually, of course, I made, I made my way downtown into the old town. Um, and it's, it's beautiful. It's a, it's a wonderful mm-hmm. city. But yeah, that... Uh, I'm kind of glad that that was my first impression out here. So I could, you know. It could only go better. From <laughs> yeah. I had exactly. the same. I actually went to the same ra- neighborhood and I was like, what the fuck did I get myself <laughs> into? But um, what made you stay? I mean, like, what was you met your wife or, or you know, what, what was the. Well, yeah, I mean, there was a, there, there was a girl involved. There always is. Um, but I, I, I don't know. I kind of settled down and I, I was into. I, I after after maybe six months here, I'd kind of gone from that everything's new and everything's shiny and interesting, sort of settled down into more of a routine. Had a group of friends, I had a girl, and it just it, it felt right. Mm. It felt right somehow. I felt it felt like something I didn't want to just uproot and get rid of. Mm. Uh, you know, I've been moving around and running running away a, a lot up until then in my life, mm. and so for some reason it just felt right. It felt solid, and I didn't want to mess with that. Mm. So. I had been teaching English briefly, which is just a horrific job. There's, mm. there's, there's no money. There's no prestige. But a lot, of, a lot of demand. Lot of demand. Like, but it's like it's. There's very little satisfaction in that in, the, in that game, and there's there's nowhere to go there. And it's not what I had ever wanted to do with my life. It was just you know to put a little cash in my pocket while I was figuring out yep. what to do. Yeah. Um, but that was that, that got old very quickly. So a friend of mine and I decided to open a bar. Mm-hmm. Uh, we put together the the little bit of savings that we both had, and we we opened uh, really a a, di- a a tiny little smoky dive cocktail bar up in Vinarati called called the Dirty Dog, mm-hmm. and it was in the basement. It was awesome. It was great. Uh, and after a couple of years of running that, uh, I wanted I, I was like, okay, this is great, but I'm a chef. This is, I'm a chef. That's what I do. I'm not a bartender. I'm not a bar guy. I, I'm a chef. Mm. I don't want to get back into a kitchen, but I don't want to go work for anybody else. I had already. Once you work for yourself, you can't go back. Mm. You just can't. Mm. <clears throat> so we sold that place, or I sold that place for a, for a pr- pretty decent profit. Put the money plus my personal savings into, plus a, a ton of borrowed money into something else, a, a bigger place with a kitchen, mm. and that just just failed miserably. That was not a. But I think I, th- I actually think that you were talking about that when I sat at the barber place that the, 
you sank a lot of money into it before you even opened. I mean, it, yeah. the, 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 it delayed on opening and stuff, right? Or, or man, man the, 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 the number of bad decisions I made with that place is mind-boggling. Mm. Just absolutely mind-boggling. And I could, I could look around and blame circumstances, blame this person, blame that person. At the end of the day, I was the boss. I made bad decisions. It mm. didn't work. That's on me. Mm. Uh, so then we were left with, um, you know, <laughs> I was left with basically nothing mm. but a grill at a shitty little van. Mm-hmm. Which we then parlayed into a food truck, which we then parlayed uh-huh. into a catering company. It's now became dirty, and that yeah, and that, that became dirty dog as we know it now. But uh, like uh, going bust or you know failing in a business like this, that didn't take away from you the the drive, you know, like you you because you know, like if if you if you've been successful i mean you yeah you you got jobs in restaurants you, you travel to europe and you mean like you're on a kind of straight and narrow path in a way like and you know, then you have a bar that works and you sell it with profit and 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 then this yeah did it feel like a failure of course massively massively yeah. Ma- it just it it, it, it was a, it's a horrible feeling you know the, there's a lot of Stupid entrepreneurship porn on the internet right now talking about how every every success is built on the back of a million fit blah 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 blah. Mm. But you know Peter Thiel says that every failure is a tragedy and we we should stop fetishizing it. Mm. And he's absolutely right. He's mm. absolutely right. Failure sucks. Mm. Failure sucks, and you learn from it and you make sure that you never ever make those same mistakes again. But failure sucks. Mm. And I've got a serious chip on my shoulder, right? I'm like a I, from I, from this. Just because of who I am. I mean, definitely from this, but it, it, that mm. chip's been there long before any of this happened. Mm. And there was absolutely no way that I could give up after that. I just can't. I'm not, I'm not built like that. Mm. And that's not, you know, some sort of work ethic or any nonsense like that. It's, 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 the, it, it's just pure stubbornness. It's pure bullheadedness. It's not a positive characteristic. Mm. It's just uh, the absolute need to wash away that shame. You know what I mean? How long did you have that business, like the the one that failed? I mean, oh, how we we were open for like maybe six months or something. It was mm-hmm. because we we had spent years of just pouring money into this other space that couldn't have worked, and then ugh, it was it, it was like a nightmare. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's just, so, so often hard for people to let go. Do you know what I mean? It's incredibly hard to let go. The the sunk you, cost fallacy is real, and yeah. nobody understands. Yeah, human beings just don't understand it. Yeah. Right? Human beings do not understand the soft the sunk cost fallacy. It is so easy for us to say, logically, I get it. Mm. The money that I spent on this yesterday has nothing to do with the decisions I should make today. And mm. that is irrelevant that we understand it intellectually because we don't understand it emotionally. Mm-hmm. We say, I've already poured so much of my blood, sweat, and tears, and money, and blah, 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 into this. Why not How a could bit Exactly, more? exactly. Mm. What's, in that? What's another 3%? Mm. And that's bullshit, mm. right? And that, that'll kill you every time. Mm. And, and so... So when you, because, you know, often we, we stigmatize mistakes, you know, like it's, um, I mean, yeah, of course, mistakes are a tragedy, but but in the end, um, you are still you. Yeah. You still have Isaac, you still have the skill set, you still have the know-how that you have. That doesn't go away with a, a bankrupt restaurant. No, or, it doesn't go away. Or a bad business, you it know. It doesn't go away. And I do like to tell people that in this business, most people have one big failure. Mm. And now I know that mind is behind me. <laughs> but do you feel like is that like is there a difference of of a mindset of a, of an American or European in this? Because I have of, often felt like, for example, in Iceland, where I come, maybe it's also because Iceland is tiny. I mean, it's it's probably smaller than Yonkers. <laughs> um, we have three hundred and sixty thousand people, you know. So bankruptcy in itself and just as a word i remember when i was a kid and you know my parents told me yeah these people are bankrupt and i just thought okay well they they're really marked you know for right. life right and and i wanted if they had food and stuff so it was a lot of stigma around it sure. and and whereas i know on my own skin because i've gone through k- k- businesses like that myself that actually i learned more from that than i learned from my successes sure sure um i but think you're absolutely right and, and but do you feel there is any? I mean, how would that be in the states? If you go bust in Manhattan, can you just start again? Um, Manhattan's Ma- Manhattan's a special case, okay. right? Just because there's the, the the best chefs in the world go to Manhattan, just mm-hmm. like the best actors in the world go to Los Angeles, right? Mm-hmm. So it's uh, the level of competition in Manhattan is is like something you've never seen before in your life, and you probably don't want to see. But I, I get where you, I get I get the question you're asking. Um, the American ethic tends to be more 
it doesn't matter what happened to you yesterday. Get your ass up and do it again. Mm-hmm. Figure it out. Mm-hmm. Get back on the horse, right? Um, and I'm definitely a product of that environment of, oh, did something bad happen to you? Fuck you. Fix it. Mm-hmm. Right? And that didn't come from my parents. My parents are very compassionate people. But it's for whatever, the environment. Exactly. For whatever reason, that's what I've picked up along the way. Oh, you got a boo-boo? Fuck you. Put some iodine on it and get back mm-hmm. to work, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, you, you, you fail, you pick yourself up, you, you dust yourself off, and you, you just do it again. Mm-hmm. You just fucking do it again. Mm-hmm. But did you feel like when you, when, you were, when you were doing this stuff here, and, and did you feel something was missing here if you look at the, the, the Czech market or Prague? Like, I don't know. Did you see, oh, okay, they're missing this American grill here. You know, oh, dude, they were missing it. Back then when I was first getting into this in Prague, they were missing everything. Mm. They were missing everything. They were like, there were two places to get a burger in town. There was uh, Max Munson's Yama and Dean and Laurie's The Tavern. That was it. Mm-hmm. There was Hard Rock Cafe and whatever, but that doesn't count. Um, there, was li- there was zero idea of customer service in, in Czech restaurants. Mm-hmm. And every, everything was one dimensional, right? Everything was like, okay, what sauce can we put with what dumplings? And then like, call it a day. That's mm. that. There was, uh, back when I moved out here, there was almost nothing interesting to eat in town. It was a, it was a wasteland for that. And that was miserable for me. Um, and just <laughs> the, the, amount of, the, the amount of change, the amount of progress that's happened over the last 10 years, I'm sure mm. you've noticed it too. Yeah, yeah. It's unbelievable. Yeah. It's unbelievable. This is, you've got restaurants in this, in this town now that rival anything in Europe. Mm. You've got restaurants here that would play in Manhattan, no problem. Mm. Um, you've got young cooks and chefs actually taking pride in their work and, and trying to get better, trying to go around to different places and gain more experience, go abroad for a couple of years, come back and open up, uh, open a small place. That didn't happen 10 years ago. 10 years ago, being a cook was a embarrassing profession. They would, uh, you know, they, they find one place that'll pay them their 22,000 a month for the rest of their life. And that's, they, they try to do yeah, as little work as possible. Dollar, thousand dollars yeah, a sorry, month about a thousand dollars a month. Yeah. yeah. yeah you're average salary back then here um and and they just you know try to do as little work as possible so they can go home have their beer and watch the football Mm -hmm. and you know cooking has become uh, a proud profession over the years and that leads to better product and more competition and better restaurants it's it's really wonderful to see what's happened Mm. but how a guy like you i mean you're full of energy i mean you're you're talking here with your hands (laughs) and you i mean like and and, yeah you're you're a you're full of energy and, and you, you thrive in this environment. I've always felt that Prague is more relaxed yeah. somehow. You know, there, there isn't this... I remember there was a Canadian guy working for me once and, and when he had been here for three months, he said, I've never seen a person on the street running to catch a bus or a tram. <laughs> like, you know, I, n- yep. no one is ever in a rush Yep. somehow. It's super, super relaxed. Mm. Isn't that a mismatch for you somehow? I mean, or, or do you know what? Do you feel like an elef- yeah. elephant in a, a porcelain store? Or? Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, uh, like a bull in a china shop. I do, mm. I do. But I like elephant in a porcelain store better. We're going to use that from now mm. on. I'm, mm. cha- I'm changing the idiom now. It's officially that. Um, yeah, I get very frustrated. I get mm. very, very frustrated sometimes, especially when you're dealing with the government or when you're dealing with somebody who, a, a supplier who just doesn't give a shit about their job. And I'm like, yo. Do your job so I can do mine. Mm. Oh, you know, I don't really have time. I'll be back from my cottage on Wednesday. Fuck you. Fuck your cottage. Do fill out the paperwork so I can do my job. Mm. It's incredibly frustrating sometimes to, especially coming from an environment that is fast and aggressive. Mm. Uh, but, you know, I'm the guest here. I have to, I have yeah, to make yeah, it work so yeah, yeah. And, and, and we won't, I mean, I, I remember when I, and I moved from Iceland to Copenhagen, and I, I, I was really hell-bent for changing Denmark yeah. for the first three years that I lived there. And then I realized, no, okay, it took them thousands of years to become like they are. <laughs> I'm not going to be the guy that nope. that. I'm no nope. messiah here, you know? <laughs> so, but, but, um, um, but, there, but there are also some positive sides to this. I mean, like the, the difference of these environments in the sense that you you have an opportunity to bring something new to the market. I mean, uh, like Absolutely, absolutely. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a secret. Mm. It's not a secret because I'm saying it publicly on the podcast, but you don't have to be creative here. Mm. You don't have to be creative here at all. Mm. There is so much that hasn't been done here. Mm. So much that's been done in New York and Berlin and London and San Francisco, but has never been done here. Mm. You just take that and you bring it here. Mm. You just take it and you bring it here. 
But you also need to execute. Well, you need to execute, exactly. Mm. Exactly right. Exactly right. But the, this is an environment where execution is much more important than creativity, which mm-hmm. is good because I'm not a creative person. <laughs> but uh, talking about that a little bit, because I, 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 I heard you on another podcast um, uh, where you were talking about this, that in some of the concepts, because now you've been involved in, I mean, you have the Dusty Dog, but you're also involved in a concept called Cali Brothers. Uh, yeah. Uh, and you were involved in the Bohemia Bagel, and, and, and there are two, three other concepts that you're involved in as a, yeah, as a, as a uh, partner, uh, as a junior partner, sort of. Uh, uh, Glenn Spicker and Scott Kelly are two very well-respected restaurant people out here, mm. uh, and they brought me on as a junior partner in their in their company, which owns Agave Restaurant, Cali Brothers Restaurant, and the Old Bohemia Bagel. Yeah, and th- and there you were talking about that the, the, there was um like somehow you found out that you can have a brilliant idea, but then you execute it poorly, and and often people then judge the idea. Yeah, they yeah. don't look at the execution. Yeah, and then you maybe find out later that actually the idea was great, but it was just how it was executed. Yeah, I mean, I, ideas are worthless, right? Yeah. Ideas are worthless, and you you know you're in the startup space in the tech space. You know, mm. you know that better than anybody. Ideas are worthless. Mm. Everyone's got an idea for the new Facebook. Yeah, like wow, hooray, congratulations. Yeah, yeah. Um, execution is everything. Execution mm. is absolutely everything. So, you know, I, I know a lot of. I, I talked before about how a lot of people who enjoy cooking at home mm. want to open a restaurant. They want to get mm. into the business. And I think it's just a horrible idea because most of them have no idea what they're getting themselves into. And so they have this great idea. They say, oh, well, I saw this thing on Instagram, this food in fucking Bermuda that they're doing on the islands. And I think it would do really well in Prague. Okay. Mm. So even if that's true, even if that's true, it's probably not true. Like, mm. Let's be honest. It's probably not true. But even if that is true, how do you go from point A to point B? How do you go from, okay, I have this idea to I'm going to make it a reality despite having no experience in the industry, mm. right? And they all fail. They all fail. Every mm. single time they fail. Mm. Uh, because they don't know how to execute. Because they, they've they conflated having an idea with being able to execute it. Mm. But do you, I mean, like, I think I read read it somewhere after you or something that, or, or someone told, or another chef or something, so, that sometimes people end up opening a restaurant exactly with the food that they miss from home. Oh, like, yeah. Is that like in your case? Is this totally, totally, uh-huh. totally, absolutely? There's a, I mean, I, you know, a lot of people ask me what the hardest part about run, uh, about this business is, mm. and it's not the staffing, which is very difficult. It's not the management of people. It's not the management of cash flow. All these things are important and mm. difficult, but for me personally, by far the most difficult part of this business is finding a balance between what I want to sell and what people want to buy. Mm-hmm. Because I, I have a bit of an ego. Most people in this business do. And I have no interest in running focus groups or asking people, oh, well, what do you want to buy? I'm not interested in that. Mm-hmm. I don't care. I want to tell them what they want. Right? Mm-hmm. I want to tell people what they yeah, want. You want to sell it to them. Exactly. I want to say, this is good because I said it's good and mm-hmm. you're going to love it. Mm-hmm. But the fact of the matter is that a lot of people, if they don't understand what something is, they're not going to buy it. And that's mm-hmm. okay. That's mm-hmm. totally fine. It's not my job to tell people what they should like. It's my job to find out what they like and give it to them. But mm-hmm. I don't like doing that. Mm-hmm. So... Every time I'm putting together a menu, I <laughs> I have to say, okay, Isaac, the fact that you really like this, the fact that you really, really enjoy this food item doesn't mean it's going to sell. Mm. And if you put it on your menu and it's not selling, you got to take it off your menu. You can't just keep doubling down on it and saying, oh, I really like it. Therefore, it should be selling better. Mm. And therefore, it's going to sell better tomorrow. But if it doesn't, it doesn't, you know? Mm. So I, there's, there's a lot of things that I've put on menus I put, I put this thing on the menu of Bohemia Bagel a few months, uh, about a year ago. Mm. It's called the Italian Combo. Mm. I think we call it the Brooklyn Combo there. And it's a, a combination of different types of Italian sliced meats, right? Different types of salamis and hams and prosciuttos with provolone cheese, lettuce, tomato, onion, roasted red peppers, and Italian vinaigrette. That sounds good. It's awesome. Mm. It's, it's the kind of sandwich that you will never, ever find in Italy. It doesn't exist in Italy, but it, it's incredibly popular in New York, and I love it. It's my favorite thing in the world. Mm. You know who doesn't love it? Mm. Czechs. Mm-hmm. You know who doesn't love it? Anybody who's not from a very specific part of New York State, you know? It's just not a thing. And mm-hmm. and they don't get it, and they don't like it, and they don't want it at all. And I'll just, take whatever you have left over. <laughs> you got it, man. I can, <laughs> I can eat 10 of these a week. It's, it's wonderful. But talking about this, actually, because this is interesting. So you're saying, okay, it's Italian ingredients in a way, like it's salamis and, and yeah. dried hams or whatever, you know? Yeah. And that's what you guys do in, in the U.S. You take foods from all over the world. And, and we bastardize them. Yeah. We bastardize the hell out of them. We make them... 
I, I say we make them better. Most people think we make it worse. I don't care. Mm. We make it better. Mm. Um, but so why is that? Is that uh, well, it's just it's an immigrant culture, right? New, America, New, New York particularly, but America in general, is, it's, it's a melting pot. Yeah, it's an immigrant mm. culture, right? People come from all over the place, uh, but they don't stay in their own little ghettos. They, they mix. Mm. They mix and they, they, they come together. It's a melting pot, not a, I don't know, multi-compartmental, I, 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 you, know, mm. you know what I'm saying? Mm. Mm. Um, it all comes together. And the pizza place that opens on this corner is going to be influenced by the Mexican taco joint on this corner. And they're all going to be influenced by the Chinese restaurant across the street. Right. Mm -hmm. So you end up with these things like, you know, if you ask me where pizza is from, I'm going to tell you pizza is from Brooklyn. Yeah. Cause I don't give a shit what they make in Italy. That's not pizza to me. That's something yeah. completely different. Uh, um, obviously that's not factually accurate, but mm -hmm. it, the pizza, <laughs> New York city pizza has become its own product. It is mm -hmm. completely unrelated to the original product from Napoli or from yeah, Rome. Yeah. yeah. It's very different. But if you so if we if we fast forward now I don't know 150 years and we're in Prague, <laughs> will there be a, a dirty dog American cuisine barbecue that has adopted some of the local things into it? Do you, do, I mean, do, do you see it go see, that, that I, way somehow? It's a really interesting question, man. That's a really really interesting question. Um, the simple answer is no, <laughs> no. <laughs> because they don't have anything that is <laughs> yeah, adaptable. Like, I mean, it's an interesting cuisine here. Like it you is. have the super meat heavy, a lot of pork, and everything cooked to the maximum. There's no no such thing as a medium raw rare here, you right. know. And to an extent, I mean, traditional Czech food is the barbecue of Europe, right? Mm -hmm. It's you take meat that otherwise would be completely inedible if you just grill mm -hmm. it, and you got to cook it for hours and hours in a sauce, right? That's braising. Mm -hmm. Braising is a direct relative of barbecue cooking method, right? So to an extent, that sort of peasant food. Because that's what barbecue was originally. It's peasant food. It's 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 poor people food, right? Mm. Um, and that that sort of check stick to your ribs, get you through a long cold winter food, is the exact same thing, just with a different flavor profile. Mm. So to an extent, we're already doing that. Um, yeah. Would I, would I try to do a little bit more fusion? I guess we could give it a shot. <laughs> the barbecue schnitzel. Yeah, we could do. <laughs> <laughs> Oh God, we do what we do. We do some fried chicken at the yeah. new place, and it's 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 wonderful. It's a, uh, you know, we brine it in buttermilk for twenty four hours, and we smoke it for eight hours just to get some flavor in there. Shit. Then we brine it again in buttermilk with herbs and garlic, double dip it in uh, like a flour and cornstarch mix with all kinds of spices. Fry it until it's golden brown. It's a wonderful product. And every single time that a Czech customer asks me for one of their one of the zizek or schnitzel, yeah, I just die a little bit inside. Yeah, they they call it that. I'm like, no, you get nothing now. You get nothing. <laughs> But talking talking about that the, the chicken and, and 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 the the poor people food the, because I was just curious because like like a lot of, like the cuisine that you're cooking is more like kind of southern American like I yeah, guess yeah New Orleans th that region right yeah, exactly. Alabama uh, and, yeah and Alabama Texas New Orleans yeah. you know, you know we, we 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 keep it broad. Yeah, you, you can't really have a podcast about uh, or with anyone from the gastro industry without talking about COVID. Yeah. And I know in your case, you 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 were... Wait, you were you were getting ready for an opening weekend yeah. of a new place when the first kind of lockdown happened here in Prague, right? Yeah, it wasn't a new place. It was uh, just the new season at Manifesto Florence. Yeah, new Florence. season. They were opening the, the court. Yeah, yeah. They, they had closed down for the winter and then yeah. we, were, we were literally... Literally the day before opening for the season is fully when the first stocked. lockdown happened. Fully stocked. Uh, probably about fifteen thousand dollars worth of inventory that we had just ordered and prepped. And that and that that guys listeners that the, like the the lockdown here was basically like a lockdown. You know, you couldn't be outside of your house unless you had official business or a justification. I mean, that there wasn't like a martial law or anything like that. But restaurants were closed. Stores Nobody closed, knew what's going to yeah. happen. Stores were closed, and it was really like a panic situation. And it, it, it happened overnight, didn't it? Yeah. It was, there was no warning. Yeah. Um, it but, was, but that's pretty much all decisions by government. Yeah, no, like that. no kidding, they, man. They don't know what to do. We, we've gone through five health, uh, <laughs> what's it called? Uh, prime ministers. ministers. Well, four plus one. Yeah, pl <laughs> yeah the same, same guy has been twice. Yeah, the first guy came back. Yeah. <laughs> so it's been a, a, a full-blown circus here. But So what did you do? Man, I mean, that was ugly. We're like, you know, I, I have to give a lot of credit to a guy named Martin Barry, who's the the owner and CEO of Manifesto. Mm. 
a uh, great American guy, very talented architect who's who specializes in turning brown fields and shithole areas into something interesting. And, you know, he and I have had our differences. We've gone at it a few times over, you know, rental clauses and stuff like that. But on the day of the lockdown, I called him personally and I said, dude, look, I got a problem. I have $15,000 worth of inventory in my fridges. If I don't move it, I'm bad. You know, we're done. We're mm-hmm. done. We're out of business. He goes, Isaac, don't worry about it. Do whatever you got to do. The space is yours. We're closing the entire site. Your container is yours. You tell us what you need. You tell us when you need access to the site. You tell us whatever resources you need. Do what you got to do. Save your business. Mm. I'll never forget that, right? Uh, so I called, my, I called my crew together. I said, guys, we, we got to do this. You know, <laughs> either, either we go out of business, I fire everybody, or we're going to figure this out. So we, we called everyone we knew at all the delivery companies. We said, get us online tomorrow. You know, we didn't have contracts with any of them, but we knew some of the people who worked, who worked for them. We said, get us online tomorrow. They did. They, they were great. Mm. Well, they were pulling 30% off of a lot of all my sales. They better mm. have been great, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we wanted to make sure that we could do some business without cutting in a different company on it, on every crown we make. So uh, we, I was up for like three nights straight. It was pretty, it, it, was, it was exhausting. We built a little e-shop on our website where people could order. And then it goes to a tablet in our in our kitchen, beeps. You know, basically we built that that same infrastructure that yeah. all the delivery companies use, but we did it ourselves using WordPress, and none of us know what the hell we're doing, but we figured it out. <laughs> uh, and and deliver the delivery boy was me in in my girlfriend's car, uh, <laughs> driving back around to the, the city. Back to the basics. My first job in the business when I was sixteen years old, delivering pizzas back in in, in Yonkers. It was great. Mm. So it was a ton of fun for a couple of days, uh, and what. The upside was we were able to keep all our people employed. We were able to keep our customers fed and within our orbit. You know, mm. it was mm. you're seeing now, now that everything's behind us, you're you're really seeing a difference between the restaurants that closed down and, and the, the ones, ones that, that stayed, stayed open, open, at least yeah. in a limited way. Yeah. yeah. Customers remember this shit, Ben. They yeah. remember. They don't they they don't forget who abandoned them. Mm. Uh so we were very lucky in that sense that we were able to keep going. Mm. But and do you do you like in this case? I mean, you, th- does your food travel well? Is it is it good for delivery? Uh, I mean, I, no food is good for delivery, right? Mm. No food in the world is good, is as good thirty minutes later. Mm. Um, but as far as food goes, yeah, barbecue is better for delivery than some other stuff. Mm-hmm. If something's already been cooked for sixteen hours, spending another thirty minutes in a box is not. Yeah, it's not, it's gonna, not the make or break. Right, exactly. It's not like a steak where. You bring yeah. it to medium rare, and then it sits in the box for thirty minutes, and now all of a sudden it's well done. You know, yeah, <laughs> yeah true. But uh, but did you did you do something new? I mean, did you have to change the menu? Because I mean, like what, what you're saying now, like w- with the reality that I think mo- most restaurants faced in this, that the, the, the only way to get the food to the customer was to to send it to him, and that comes with an extra cost. Yeah, that like especially I think in the beginning, customers were maybe more aware of, or you know, more concerned about. So did you have to make your stuff cheaper or, you know, figure out the way to, to hit the price spot somehow? Or, or All right, so here's what we did. Uh, I, I don't believe in making things cheaper. Mm. We, we set our prices not based on what I feel like making today. We, it, it's the end of an equation, right? It's a cost plus model. Mm. It costs us this much to make it. It costs us this much to pay salaries and other fixed costs. Therefore, we have to charge this much. Mm. So I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't like to do discounts or anything like that. But what we did do was we were aware that a lot of people were losing their jobs. We were a lot aware that a lot of people were going to run low on disposable income. Mm. And so we had to be able to, I don't want to say target a different type of market, but we had to give, we wanted to make sure that everyone had the opportunity to get something from us mm. if they wanted it. Mm. So we opened a couple of ghost concepts. One was called Sausage Party. Yeah. And it did uh, <laughs> gourmet hot dogs. I can't believe I'm saying this out loud. That's not worth it. Did you market it on Grinder or... or? On, on what, sorry? Grinder, that's a <laughs> Grinder, no, no, no. <laughs> um, but we did make a lot of penis jokes. It was funny. Mm. And the second one was called Lord of the Wings. Yeah, I remember that one, actually. Really? Yeah, yeah, I saw that name. Oh, nice. Um, that was good. And, and Ghost Kitchen, Just that, that's when, when there is no storefront. Yes, it's, it's a, a, a virtual concept, we call it sometimes, mm. or a cloud kitchen. It's, it's a concept that exists only on the internet and only is available for delivery. Mm-hmm. And... Even if COVID and the lockdowns hadn't happened, I think that this was still going to become a thing. Mm-hmm. It's the it's the you know the Uberization of the world. Mm-hmm. If there's a way to sell something purely on the internet, people will find a way to do it, right? Mm-hmm. And this is the it's a, it's the logical next step. We all we were all so smart. We said, oh, 
oh, my, I, I'm, I'm a chef. My business can't be outsourced. Guess what? It can, and it will. Mm-hmm. This was the logical next step. So COVID just gave it a boost a little bit. but Yeah, exp- it sped it up a little bit. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But this was going to happen no matter what. Mm. So, yeah, ghost kitchens are a thing now. I'm not a fan because I think that uh, so much of the restaurant business is built not just on food, but on interactions, right? And on, atmosphere. Yeah, atmosphere. Yeah. Exp- people go out for an experience, not just because yeah. they're hungry. If you're hungry, yeah. you go to you go to the local pub and you pay 150 crowns. You pay seven dollars for uh, you know a mediocre lunch. Yeah. People go out because they want something better. They want they want to they want to feed their soul, not just their stomach, right? Mm. Um, and the whole idea of ghost concepts just destroys that. Mm. And just like almost everything else in this modern internet age. It just takes money out of the pockets of the people who are doing the work and puts it in the middlemen's pockets. Mm. So whether it's Uber or Walt or Bolt well, exactly, or whatever. Exactly. You know. Or I don't want to talk shit about that. I have relationships with a lot of these guys no, and I like no, them. And they're, you know, they're, but doing, they're doing, they're doing, a, they're, they're they're doing filling a great a need job the and, exactly. they, and they, need to, they need to feed their mouths as well. Exactly you know? right. And, and, and I, I think a lot of these, I mean, a lot of these delivery services, it's a tech, you know, the, the, yeah, they built it around technology. Right. And... I'm pretty sure that, well, maybe it's different now, but I'm pretty sure before COVID, they were not making tons of money. The business case was all about being able to scale at some point exactly. and sell it as an idea, which now maybe they have a proof that it actually can work. But but it's a lot of money for a restaurant to lose 20 to 30% of their margin to a delivery company. Right. And people, you know, a lot of people like to say, oh, well, you should just do your own internal delivery. Mm. And my answer to that is, Fuck you, yeah, obviously. Yeah. But yeah, uh, because then you need to own a car or, or lease a car. You need believe to have it or not, that's not even the biggest problem. I mean, yes, you got you got you, you got you got driver salaries. You'll never have the economies of scale that the mm. delivery companies have. You'll never be able to lean on that kind of tech that they have to keep things efficient. That's all true. But the number one reason, the number one problem, the number one reason why your average restaurant can't implement their own delivery is because if you go on Google and you type in dirty dog barbecue, the first five things you will see are links not to my website. Mm but to my pages on the various delivery company apps. Mm-hmm. They ha- they put so much fucking money into marketing mm-hmm. that they have taken up all the... F- yeah, all the search spots. Exactly right. Everything. Mm. Everything. So you can't even... And I'm not talking about just the ads. Yeah, the first three things will be ads from the delivery companies. Mm-hmm. But after that, it's going to be organic make, hits. should make the podcast available on one of those delivery apps. There you They're go. That'll get me really high <laughs> on Google. <you laughs> there know? you go. <laughs> there you go. Great idea. So even if I have my own... Delivery e shop, mm. right? Even even if I if we, we took that offline after the first lockdown, but even if we put that back on, mm. and even if I hired all my own drivers, the first thing that ninety nine percent of the people are going to see when they search for my for my company else. is somebody else's page. Mm. Exactly right. But how, like during this time and during during this COVID uh, uh, experience that we went through here, then I guess you were the ones who ate last. Everybody else got paid before <laughs> to the extent, owner yeah. got. Paid, right? to, uh, I mean, you course, you probably course. couldn't take a lot of money out of it. Uh, dude, right? I, I didn't take a salary for months. No. For months and months, I, I blew through all my personal savings during COVID. I was I was I was done. Mm-hmm. I was absolutely done. But it's what we had to do. You know, the the alternative was closing everything down, and some people did that. Some people put up, uh, you know, GoFundMe pages, mm. which I find. Yeah, I don't like that. Embarrassing. Uh, something. Yeah, something. There's something wraps me the wrong way with that. Exactly. If you're doing if you if you're doing a GoFundMe page or what do they call it out here, Kickstarter or uh, yeah. Hit Hit or whatever, yeah. it damn well better be for a really cool new project yeah. that you need funding for, yeah. not just to pay your rent because you can't do it yourself. Yeah. And, um, but the, b- b- one thing that I've seen like now, COVID has. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm seeing the indicators in um, everywhere that it changed so many things. You know, people now work from home; they spend more time in, uh, in their home. So, some people are ordering more food than they did before. They yeah. go less to the restaurants. Yep. And I feel I don't know if you, if you feel that, but what, from what I see around me is that the price sense is less. Like. Because you know people are paying. Let's say they buy buy something from from you for two hundred crowns, which is like I don't know ten ten dollars. No. Yeah. Yeah. yeah about ten dollars. Yeah. Ten dollars, and then they maybe pay another five on top for delivery. Yeah. You know, and 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 they don't care. They don't care. And, they don't and care. It's it's it's. I I I bought. I've been buying burgers home. You know, for I don't know. I'm 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 getting burgers home for what twenty thirty, no more twenty thirty dollars. Yeah, something like that. Something like that. Yeah. I, Two years ago, that would have been... It's madness, right? Yeah, $8 madness, in the yeah. restaurant. You yeah, know, like yeah. it's, it's, um, b- But 
this is probably here to stay. People oh, don't want to go back to absolutely. the office. And companies don't want them because it's better to keep them at home. They, yeah, they pay less rent. Exactly. The, 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 the world has turned on its head. Absolutely. Mm. Um, and the whole economy has gone crazy. The mm. economy has gone absolutely out of its mind. Mm. People are complaining that we're, that restaurants are increasing prices. They should be, I mean. <laughs> they should look at the salary increase. Well, we, I, mean, we, we, we <laughs> I speak not just for us, but for everyone I know who owns a restaurant. Yeah, we've all increased prices significantly less that our expenses have increased. Mm. We're, we're taking it in the ass right now. Mm. We're, we're, we're between salaries going up because uh, the, 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 mar- the, the labor market is insane right now. Nobody's looking for jobs right now. Yeah. Between that, we, <laughs> every single thing that happens in China has an effect on the entire world, right? Mm. Every single shipping container that doesn't get filled and sent out to, to the world from China slows something down. Slows something down, exactly right. Go up. Exactly right. So, we just outfitted our, our container at the new Manifesto Market. We paid literally 1.7 times more for all of our equipment than we would have paid two years ago. That's crazy. That, and that 1.7 times more. Mm. That's not attributable to inflation. Mm. That's not attri- attributable to a, a little blip. Mm. That's just insane problems with transportation. This is what, I, I heard this. I have, a, I, have a, I have a friend who is in the auto industry, and he's moving cars around. And he, So he told me, I don't know if it's true, but he told me that the problem is that Processing of each container is taking too long time, yep. so the, the the ships are docking much longer because of COVID. Yep, and that means there are simply not enough empty containers around to fill up the new one. So, exactly right. So exactly right. So and so, that domino effect goes yeah. crazy. So we're paying we <laughs> we we import brisket from the U.S. or from Australia, uh-huh. generally from the U.S. because that's where the better product is. But when the U.S. product can't get here, we get it from Australia. <laughs> <laughs> Two years ago, we were paying one one ninety a kilo. I think uh, about just under ten dollars per kilo. Mm. We are <laughs> we are now paying seventeen dollars per kilo. Wow. We are now paying seventeen to eighteen dollars per kilo. And I can't imp- I can't increase my prices enough to cover that. There's no mm. way. So every time I sell a slice of brisket, I'm losing money. Mm. I'm taking money out of my pocket every time I sell a slice of brisket. That's okay, you know. Things balance out. But yeah, I mean, maybe this comes back to some extent. I mean, the, these, I mean, this empty containers problem eventually would solve itself, but it will have rolled or started a lot of exactly. stuff. You exactly, know? you can't, you, you can't just overnight come back to zero on that. Yeah. What you were saying is really interesting about how the containers aren't getting emptied and filled fast enough, yeah. and that's absolutely correct. But I was talking to this guy. He he owns out in a... Oh, where the hell is it? Right past David's... Uh, one of those small villages. Mm. Brevnov or, or... No, 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 no. Past, past there. Oromeris. Uh, mm. uh, one, 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 one of the... We're the really good with those names. Yeah. <laughs> we're fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Long-term expats, you know. Yeah. Um, he owns a, 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 an, a, an area that is just full of shipping containers. Mm-hmm. And he buys and sells shipping containers for a living. And the ones that he has on on the site, he rents them out to, for people to use as storage units. Uh, as an aside, the reason I know him is because my scooter got stolen a while ago. Uh-huh. It ended up getting taken to one of his storage units. The re- person renting the storage unit didn't pay rent for a while, so he broke into, into the, found, into the scooter. unit, found like 10 scooters in there, called the police, said these have to be stolen. Uh-huh. It, was, it, was, it was awesome. So I'm out there waiting for the police technician to come and take fingerprints. We found the guy. He's going we've, off we've, the fingerprints we've, or? Uh, or off off security camera footage of his tattoos. I kid you wow. not. I kid you not. It was okay. Awesome. I need to have long sleeves from now. <laughs> yeah, right. I'm, I'm, I'm stealing shit, scooters. I'm be yeah. Careful, right? <laughs> um, so I'm talking to this guy who owns the area, and he's telling me that he used to sell. He used to buy conta- buy shipping containers for I think what was it like a. All right, I'm making up numbers at this point. I don't know. I mm-hmm. can't remember. But the price of shipping containers, the price of buying and selling used shipping containers has literally doubled over the past two years. Mm -hmm. And he's telling me that it's because the Chinese used to fill their containers, put them on a ship, send them to Europe, send them to America, where the people would unload it. And the price that they're paying the Chinese includes the stuff in the container and it includes the container itself. Mm -hmm. So they buy the container with Uh everything inside of it. Then they send that container onto somewhere else full of something else. Now the Chinese are refusing to do that, and they're insisting that people empty the containers. Send it back. I'd send it back, exactly right, uh-huh. so that they can strangle the... The economies. Exactly right. It's exactly a conspiracy, right. you think? It, no, it's not a conspiracy at all. It's a good business. I hate them No, no, it. I mean, but do you, th- do you think... I mean, because I think that, that China is, is the one that would profit the most out of COVID. Exactly right. Because, you know, they make all the stuff that we're buying, and, and, and it's, it's a, actually a crazy thing, because 
we what we did during this time is that we sent home people, healthy people, you know, young people yep. that are not in risk groups and stuff yep. like that. And like in here in this city, and we kept all the older people working in the supermarkets, at the post office, <laughs> in the coal, in the coal mines, it's in the so factories, yep. and they're all diabetic and you know older and sicker and stuff like that. They they had to keep on working. Then we sent home a twenty five year old, I don't know, like a business <laughs> educated person to wear pajamas. Wait, and we gave them money. We 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 we, we paid companies for keeping people at home, and we paid companies for laying off people. We closed down small and medium-sized businesses yep. like yours and, and screwed them yep. royally. Yep. So all the money went to Amazon, Google, Facebook, Netflix, Absolutely. everywhere. Absolutely. So we, we moved, like in the US, I read, I think it was like, I think it was like trillion, $1.7 trillion or something wealth transfer from the poor to the rich. I believe it. I and, believe and it. And we do it on a Democrat shift or, I mean, a mix of, <laughs> right, of, right. of, of Republican, Democrat. And 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 this is happening in front of our eyes, and from the people who are keeping us safe. But they're actually keeping, they're making people like you go out of business, and giving it, giving that money to the big companies in in the form of through tax money yep. that you will then pay when yep, you get a exactly. job somewhere. You know, exactly it's, it's, right. It's, it's just a, it's a, it's such a, yeah, fascinating uh, chain of events somehow. Anyway. Uh, so you think it's here to stay? Home delivery? Yeah, absolutely. Less absolutely. people in the restaurants? Uh, no, not less people in the restaurants. I don't think that's going to... You know, we, I, I, I've watched uh, basically every place that I'm involved in mm. just sling back to normal very quickly uh-huh. as soon as the restrictions were over. What People are eating more or they're, buying le- and they're cooking less at home? Uh, they're, they're cooking less at home. I, mm. I, I, it, it's just... I'm not going to say that sales volumes went back to what they were before COVID overnight. But, but people are coming. Yeah, people are coming. People are, I'm not, you know, we're, we're not, uh, everyone kept talking about, oh, it's going to take a long time to go back to normal, blah, 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 blah. Mm. It, there's a lot of restaurants that are struggling still. None of the places that I'm involved in are. Uh, but, you know, the, the, the places on Old Town Square. Yeah, where all the tourists would be. And- exactly. The ones that are selling beer for, you know, Twelve dollars and, yeah. and just really mediocre food for fifty dollars and shitty service. Exactly right. They're going out of business, and I am not crying. Mm-hmm. I don't care. No, we don't. We, 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 these are not the crown jewels of this city no. for sure. These are embarrassments to the gastro industry. But but talking because we say shitty service. I mean that that was for me that was the kind of the shocker when I came in. I mean I came from Denmark where they are not really nice, uh, but here I often felt like hostility in a you know almost yeah and uh, but that has changed right yeah, it has changed drastically drastically yeah. which is great um it, it's ch- it's changed so much to the point where uh, this was a couple of years ago a buddy of mine and i who he's american we had been out here for probably about the same amount of time i think he came out here maybe a year before me mm. we were sitting in a, a truly shithole czech pub uh it was in carlin i think we were somewhere mm. around here one of those old school places where with bright lights, mm. wooden tables, all the interior decoration has been done by the beer company yeah. and the surliest asshole of a waiter in the world. And we're sitting there. <laughs> we're sitting there nostalgically talking about how much, it, how, how it's a shame that places like this don't really exist anymore. Mm. Oh, you know, the traditional Czech pub, they're just not, they're, they're all going out of business. It's too bad. And I'm like, wait a second. Ten years ago, he and I were sitting in these shitty Czech pubs talking about how much we hate this country yeah, and want to go yeah. back to a place where customer yeah. service and good food exists. You know, yeah, but it's this ignorance that it has. Bo- it's it's both charming and and terrifying in, exactly. in some way. You know, exactly. Um, you said somewhere that I'm I'm just gonna quote you here that uh, you you are you're not in the well. You said it actually earlier here. Now you're not you're not you're not doing this because you love to cook. You love the atmosphere. You love the excitement. You love the. It brings out in you some sort of a, an animal, and 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 <laughs> you know, like that. Uh, it gives you a connection to cook that that animals on a, on a grill <laughs> gives you a connection to your caveman, inner caveman. It sounds like something I would say. Yeah, but uh, isn't that gonna? You know, is is that? Well, first of all, isn't that guy out of fashion? You know, like I don't we care. I don't care. No? <laughs> I mean, yeah, he probably is, but I don't care. But we are being like we as humans. We are, we are we are just you know now we are supposed to 
drink with uh, wooden straws and we Ugh. are supposed to eat this and that and we're not supposed to do this and that. I mean... Look, I'm, I'm all for getting rid of plastic straws, but I think we should mm. get rid of straws in general. I think straws mm. are a ridiculous thing that we don't need. Um, but there are other bigger... I mean, we at the same time, the same people that are not using plastic straws, they're ordering food from China or, or, or clothes from China. Or for delivery. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah exactly. and Amazon five packets a week. And exactly. Instead, instead, of, instead of walking 500 meters to the, to the, to the pizza place, they're, they're ordering it for delivery. So some dude mm. in, a, in a car has to bring it over. Yeah. Mm. But are you a dinosaur, do you think? Are, and, and in your industry, or have you have you updated yourself? <laughs> are you softer now? Well, I mean, yeah, I've, yeah, I've softened up. I, I, I had a beautiful little baby girl about mm. eight months ago, so I've softened up a little bit. But I don't know, man. I There are times when I think I was born too late. There are mm. times when I think I was born too late. In in, in the old days, <laughs> people people didn't send emails. They just whacked each other with swords when, when they didn't like something. Mm. I, I, you know... <laughs> Human beings have gone soft, mm. and it's the natural pro- it's the natural progression of technology making our lives easier. It's mm. the natural progression of no longer having to hunt for food and defend your lands against rivals. Mm. So we're at the we're at the top of that hierarchy of needs pyramid that we talk about a lot, and everything's become about self actualization, and everything's become about talking about feelings. And everything's about filing paperwork correctly. Mm. And it's incredibly boring. Mm. It's incredibly boring. And there are times when I wish I was born in, I don't know, an ancient world. Or if I, 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 I born as a cowboy or a pirate or something. I don't yeah. know. There's nothing left to explore, is there? There's nothing mm. left to... No, but that's, that's, that's very much, though, the, the, let's say, the environment that we live in. You know, let's say, I think, and I think that, that's the interesting thing about this. Because I, I, I tend to agree with you. I, 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 it, it's... Now, and I was actually thinking about it, you know, we, I, I remember, you know, like uh, the Cold War, you know, like, right. okay, guys, you, you need to know, we were taught at school, okay, so this is what happens if they throw an atomic bomb. I mean, it was a very kind of uh, pointless training because we would all be dead, but <laughs> you should die at least then under a table. <laughs> under under yeah. a wooden table, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and then... And then I was thinking about it, like, okay, because, you know, I was, I was walking the street there, and I, I, I know that I can be nasty and... But I don't give a shit. I sometimes I want to be nasty. And there was this, I see those 20, 25-year-olds walking far away from any danger, wearing a mask. And I started thinking, how can you get to this point <laughs> that you you either walk out in nature or in, on the street where there's no one nearby and you wear a mask? And it's not because there's a toxic pollution in the air. It's it's a, yeah, it's, it's, a, right. it's a virus that, that you've been programmed to be scared of. And... And then I started thinking about, okay, so what experience do those people have? Any war that is now being fought is fought by, from distance, it's fought somewhere away from where we live, yep. it's fought by people that we don't know, it's, you know... It's fought by drones. Yeah, and, and, and so it's, it's, it's so... Anything that protects what we have now, anything that protects the power balance of the world that makes us living this beautiful empire that we are still living yep. in, you know, where we have plenty of everything and more food than we can eat and whatever, and we don't have to kill the neighbor for land or, or hunting territory. Yeah. We, we, all these fights are happening so far away from us. Yes. And we take everything for granted. Yes. So and we get why soft would, yeah, and we get weak. Yeah, yeah. And, and when we die from, the, you know, it's going to kill itself from the inside. Right. Eventually the empire will fall. Absolutely. No question. And because there are the people that fill the containers in China that yes. are willing to work 20 hours a day for shitty salary, and but they're not going to do it forever, you know? Right. There are people in Africa, there are people in South America, in India. I mean, there's plenty of places in the world where where they don't, they can't order food online to right. get sent to their home in the pajamas. And, and they're they have hungry. To, they yeah, and they this. have to go out and f- fucking hunt. Exactly. Exactly. So, and for us here in the West, there's no battles left to fight. No. There's no battles left to fight. Mm. It's all done. Yeah. It's all behind us, and it's sad. So we but then we fight about pronouns. Right, exactly. We fight about bullshit. We fight mm. about absolute nonsense. Mm. I remember my, my dad a while ago, and he's, he's you know, I, I'm a bit left-wing in the U.S. at least, mm. not so much in, in, in Europe. And my father is far more left-wing than me, very, very liberal, very, you know. And so for him to say something like this, I was shocked, right? He, he's, he's always the one who, well, let's see it from their point of view first before we have an opinion, blah, blah, blah. Mm. And I, I love that about him. I respect that about him. And I'm just not like that. Mm. Um, and he, he says to me, he goes, Isaac, I'll tell you something. <laughs> when, when the when the revolution comes, the conservatives are going to have the guns, and we're still going to be arguing about pronouns. Yeah. And he's absolutely right. He's absolutely mm. right. We've gotten soft. We've gotten weak. There's no more battles left to fight. So we make people fill out paperwork. 
and we make people go to various offices for absolutely no reason other than to make it feel like we have a job mm. that we've done. But that's also that's also another thing. But like, and that's I think very much the the America has kind of let that. I mean, education has been commercialized in a way. Like there are schools everywhere, and they all want to sell you access to the. It's business. Yep. It's a profit business. Yep. So it's better for them to get you there, even if you aren't made for school. I mean, imagine if 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 your school would have just done whatever they could to get you through that political cycle, yeah. and you would have been the shittiest <laughs> lawyer in the world. Or, yeah, no you, you know what I mean? Instead no of, kidding. Instead of going out there, feeding hundreds of thousands of people, making them happy, and being happy about it yourself. Or if they had said, hey, Isaac, this probably isn't for you. Mm. Maybe go to maybe go to trade school. Yeah. You know, because right, right now in America, at least in, in my societal stratum, mm. trade school, vocational school, it's not something you do. No. And that's horrible. Because yeah, because we're missing those people. Exactly right. Who do you think is going to make more money? A kid with a bachelor's degree in political science who never made it to law school or a kid who spent two years in plumbing school? Mm. The fucking plumber's going to blow the kid, the, 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 the liberal yeah. arts kid out of the water. He's going to yeah. blow him out of the water. Yeah, yeah. And he's going to have a great life while the liberal arts kid is working for me as a bartender. Yeah. Do you miss the States? Hell yeah, every day, man. Every and what, day. What, what specifically? Oh, the food, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, miss, I, I miss New York. Mm -hmm. I really, really miss New the York. Bus. Sorry? The bus and the noise and the... Yeah, exactly. I miss the, I miss the speed. I miss the noise. I miss the... Uh, you're, I miss not, you're an adrenaline junkie. You need <laughs> adrenaline. You need something, you know? I need, I, need, I need some kind of hobby. I need a hobby. I got to stop just working and going mm -hmm. home and watching TV about working. But how, how does that fit to, to have a kid then? I mean, oh, it's tough, man. It's tough. I don't, I, I don't see her nearly as much as I want to, nearly as much as I should. Mm. Um... And oh, like, how old is she? She's eight months old now, almost eight months old. Mm -hmm. And I like to say it's because we just opened this new place in Andiel, da, 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 but guess what? And I, so I, you know, I need time to stabilize it, get everybody trained, get my team up to par. Guess what? As soon as that happens, there's going to be something else. Mm. There's going to be another bullshit excuse. It's all, it's all bullshit excuses. We can all find time for what we prioritize, right? Mm. We can all find time for what we want to find time for. But do you... Do you you know, like um, work-life balance, you know, like isn't that, like we said, you know, gastro is a lifestyle. Yeah. And it feeds something in you. But it doesn't have to. It doesn't have to. I know I know gastro people who mm. find time with their family. Mm. I know them. They don't do it at the same time as everyone else does, right? They don't go to work from 9 o'clock in the morning to 5 or 6 o'clock in the evening. Mm. Maybe their time with their family is at 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock in the morning. Mm. And then they come home at midnight, right? It, it doesn't mean that... We have the same schedules as everyone else, but yeah, it, yeah, it yeah. is doable. I yeah, know yeah. it's doable. I just haven't figured out how yet. Mm. But I, it's it's uh, I, you know in my, my previous uh, some of my previous jobs, I I I I got energized from 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 the action. You yeah. know you know what I mean. And, oh, yeah. and and the job kind of consumed me. I became the job, and the Absolutely. job became me. Absolutely. And I guess like in your case, you are everything. You're marketing. You're Sales, your menu, your suppliers, your public authorities, your your. I mean, I'm lucky that I'm very lucky that as we've grown, I've gotten more people around you, around me, and helping. helping but still, it's on you. At the end of the day, yeah, of course. At the end of the day, absolutely, it's on me. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm lucky enough to have uh, Hanka, my wife. She handles all our marketing. She's amazing at it. Mm -hmm. uh, Tomas, he's my my business partner. Him and a few investors. He handles all of our financial matters and administrative things that and that's that's new that's only a few months old and it's yeah. just a, it's a game changer for me having other people take that stuff off my plate it's it's it's, it's wonderful mm. so this romantic idea about cooking the food that you love cooking at home and <laughs> taking it out to the greater you know greater <laughs> group of people i think i think and i think that's the reality check you know then you realize shit i need to do all these other things yeah. as well oh absolutely absolutely the reality is far more time spent in front of a computer than i ever thought uh-huh I, I, you get into this business because you don't want to sit in front of a computer, right? You, you right. become a chef because you you want to be out there working with your hands, with your crew, in the shit. And then next thing you know, you're staring at spreadsheets all day. Yeah. You're, you're replying to emails about nothing. But, um, so you miss the stage, you miss the bus. Um, I, miss, I miss breakfast. Yeah. You know what I miss? That, that's what, if I had to choose one thing, that's what I miss. I miss breakfast. Uh -huh. I miss being able to to... to I miss having restaurants that serve breakfast. That's just I like that. When I've been in Manhattan, I've been there, luckily enough, a lot of times. And I love that. I love being in Manhattan. I actually love being in Brooklyn as well. And, and yeah, anywhere in, in the U.S., more mm -hmm. or less. Um, and I, I agree with you. You yeah, can right? go and get a, a great breakfast, yeah. you know, and, and 
Yeah, eggs and pancakes yeah, and coffee, whatever. Yeah, you want. bacon and yeah. orange juice and all yeah. that stuff, you know, and and this Dean and Deluca places. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that, or just that any, stuff, any, sh- you know? any any little diner on the corner. Yeah, it's just everywhere. And here yeah. you get a croissant and Fla- the flame grill. What's it called? The New Yorkers, the, f- the, the, f- the red flame grill or something. And they, you know, I bought this stack of pancakes of like fifteen centimeters of pancakes. There you, you go. Know? Oh, there you go. That's what's up. It. God, I missed that. If you left here, what would you miss about here? The ability to have a beer with lunch without people telling you to go to meetings. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 I'm kidding. Um, oh. It's a good question. It's a really good question. Uh, it's more relaxed. It's somehow. more. Rela- it, 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 it's it's civilized here. Yeah. It's 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 more civilized. In Less the sense competitive that in in a way that you know you would never. Here you can. You don't have to think that your neighbor wants to pull himself up on your shoulders. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Um, it's it's. It's calm, it's clean, it's mm. safe. And mm. these are things that I never cared about until I had a kid. But if I had to choose where I want my daughter growing up, do I want her growing up in Manhattan, which is the mm. place that I love more than anything in the world, mm. or here, I would choose here. Yeah. Absolutely, no question. Because yeah. I don't have to worry about what's going to happen. You know, when she's, I don't know, 12 years old, she's going to take the tram to school by herself. You don't do that, right? You yeah. don't do that in Manhattan. No, that's true. I mean, yeah, the Czech Republic in Prague has has a lot of lot of. Cor- I mean, otherwise, people like me and you who are going to be here for a month or six months yeah, or three months would never want to stay. You know, right? like, yeah. And a lot of a lot of Americans say that you know, oh, this is real freedom because you know you actually have the freedom to you know you good transportation, you can That's sit bad. down and have a beer, and and you know it's it's relaxed somehow. And you, yeah, and you don't have to be worried about being robbed or, or, sure. or something like sure. that, except your scooter. <laughs> oh, I le- okay, I left it unlocked. I left it completely with with zero security features enabled oh. whatsoever. Yeah. I had a, I had a, like a beautiful chain lock sitting in the what do you call it? The trunk is that yeah, a trunk on yeah. a scooter? I don't know. I don't know. I'm like I, I remember I remember closing it that day. I'm like oh, I'm too tired. I don't feel like putting the chain on. Fuck it. It's not important. Yeah, you're playing guitar. There was a time. There was a time I'm, in a band. I, or? No, God, no. I mean, I haven't touched my guitar in, in years. That was just an example I gave of like things that. You would love to do things. I want to get back to things. I want to, you know, uh, it, it all goes back to the work-life balance. You yeah. know? I did. I did that actually. I, I I played as a teenager, and I I went back to it now. Nice. And it's so much fucking fun. It's great, right? I do one hour lesson per week. Yeah. And I'm still. I mean, I'm shitty, but I've still. I've learned. I've, you know, it's, I don't know, six months or something that I've been studying. It's it's so fucking great. Highly recommended. Got a good teacher because it's yeah, a great teacher. I'll tell you about yeah, it. Yeah, and, yeah. And and. Uh, and the the great thing about it is that that one hour, you're just there. You, yeah, you, you know, you know exactly. What I mean? It gets you out of whatever yeah. you were doing before. You're not frying a chicken, or exactly, you're not, you know, exactly. you're sending an email or, or whatever. Exactly. It gets you out of everything. That's so important, man. That's so important. That's great. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think, guys, like we're kind of, yeah, we're kind of good to go, um, guys. Um, follow the show. I I, I rebranded it. Uh, from the the bunker, how the hell did we end up here? To the blah blah bunker. So you will find the blah blah bunker. It's hard to say blah blah bunker fast <laughs> because you kind of say blah blah bunker. Blah blah bunker. It's a great uh, name though. Yeah, uh, blah blah bunker. You will find that on on Instagram and on uh, Twitter and on Facebook, a Facebook page. And uh, so follow that and uh, subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcast, Google Podcast, Castbox, iHeart, iHeart Audible. Everyone has me. Um, and uh, yeah, review the show on I- Apple Podcast. That's a really good thing to do. Isaac, are you going home to cook? Oh, no. <laughs> what time is it? What time is it? It's, it's, it's 7 o'clock. You think I'm going home? That's cute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's rush hour in the in the place now. I guess. Exactly. Oh, yeah, I gotta, I'm gonna head over to Cali Brothers, see yeah. what's happening with uh, my 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 buddy Chef Scotty over there, and then back to one of the Dirty Dogs, and then hopefully home in time for the the debate tonight. Yeah, uh, uh, the political yeah, debate. Yeah, yeah. Ah, they're voting here. Yeah, the elections are this Friday. Uh huh. Yeah, we we just found out that the Prime Minister of Czech Republic has a chateau in France that was worth something like uh, I don't know, like. Uh, 20 million dollars or yeah. something. Yeah, 20 million dollars, exactly. Million dollars or something. And he, he bought it through, you know, several offshore companies, clearly hiding dirty I would cash. have done exactly the same. Yeah, exactly. Like, if why I, wouldn't if you? If I had the money. Exactly. <laughs> but the best part is that nobody cares. No. Nobody cares. The no. people who support him are still going to support him. No. The people For the people who hate him, like myself, this is no surprise at all. Mm-hmm. 
I, I, yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm not enough into the politics here. Because you speak the language, I don't. So you, you follow things more. And you have your, your wife is from here. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah my, mine is, my girlfriend isn't from here, so we, we're kind of in our bubble still. Sure. Thanks for coming. Thank you for having me, man. This was great. This was a ton of fun. Cool. Bye. Take care.